Okay. Sorry about that. Um. All right. What'd you guys do over the weekend? Who who added a route? That was your homework problem. Who added a route to your little application? If it did, what did it do? Yeah. People are port following instructions. Give me an example of something you guys might want to add. So so where are we? So we're we're at the point where we have a small uh, working web application. Doesn't do much interesting yet, but we don't. Just getting started, sort of getting the lay of the land, getting things set up, right? So, right now, this responds to a couple of different, a um, couple of different routes, right? Responds to a request for the root document with text. Responds to a request for the uh, account with a count of, in this case we're using the second part of the URL as a parameter, right? So, um, and then we can also add numbers. So who, who wants to, give me an example of something you guys might want to do. Right? This, is, this is some sort of program that we can now expose you know, over the public internet and do whatever we want with. So who wants, to give me a suggestion of something to add, right? sort of do it. So some new functionality that we want to have. David. Maybe a test we do. So I just send the uh, asking for a routing and this is what I want to do. I want to multiply by. Okay, yeah. So so we can, we can so, so David's suggestion is why don't we expand our math backend to do some other types of operations, right? So right now we have a route for add, peel some parameters off, Form the result, return it. We're also remember returning JSON. We integrated uh, JSON into our project last time. So if I run run this here, and then go, that's it, you can ignore that error message. Go to whatever route I've configured. I see hello world, and if I do add four or five. I see the results come back. And again, your display looks a little bit different. I have a Chrome plugin that formats JSON nicely for me because I look at it time to time. So, okay. So how do we do this? Who has a suggestion for, so, so what's, what's, what would be some, let's say we want to also support subtraction. What's sort of an obvious way to do this? Who has an idea? Straightforward, right? Let's just try to do one more thing. Make yeah, let's just make another, support another route, right? I have already have a lot of the code I need right here, right? So let's just, we'll just do some cut and pasting. And we'll say, we'll call this subtract. Okay, we're gonna do the same thing. Now at this point, I probably don't, I, I probably wanna call this something different, my result. Right, this is add result, and I want to support more types of operations. So, what should I do here? What do you guys think? There's no right answer here. I don't really want to return an add result from a subtraction. So, what should I, what should I add to this? No wrong answers here. What do you guys think? We can add another class. Yeah, so I, I could do. So what what do you want to call it? Yeah, so I could add a class called subtract result. Right. That basically looks really similar to this. Now down here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to return a subtract result. Um, Name this as well. Uh, and of course, I need to actually do this differently. All right, so so that'll work. All right, we'll, we'll test it. Shut down our server, restart it. It's gonna 
build for a second. And then when it's ready to go, go back here, make sure add still works, and let's try subtract. Okay. Just one way to do it. Well, what would we what would we do next if we kept following this pattern? Yeah, we could do multiplication the exact same way. But like, this is starting to feel like there's something that I can. It's starting to feel like whenever you so you know I you know you guys have to make personal decisions about how to do this. My my personal rule of thumb is when you cut and paste code the first time, that might be okay. You know, like you don't want to try to make your code too general right away. But once you're starting to cut and paste code the second time, sorry, the third time, or the fourth time, we do divide. Then you might start to think about whether or not you can extract this out into a more general pattern rather than continuing to maintain this. So let's do that instead. So what, what do we want to do here? Again, I can add another route for multiply and another route for you know divide and another route for exponentiation and logarithm and all sorts of stuff like this. But but what would I actually wh what's a what's another approach here? Instead of just cutting and pasting this over and over again, I'm going to end up with like very, I mean, I've already got two routes that look identical, right? And then I've also got two classes up here that look identical. So what should I do instead? Stick. We really want to, yeah, what do you think? Yeah. So the idea here is that look at these two routes add and subtract. They're almost identical. Except the only, where's the only difference? It's literally just this. Even the classes that I'm using to store the results are identical. Right? Just they're different classes, but they're the, the data shape is identical. So instead, let's change this to be another route parameter. So now my route has three parameters. The first one is an operation to perform. And the second two are two numbers that I'm going to use as part of that operation. Now, now, clearly this isn't general enough to really work for everything, right? Because not every mathematical operation takes two operands, but that's okay, right? This will still get us a long way, right? Because we can support things like um, add, subtract, multiply, divide, exponentiation, you know, things like this. All right, so what do we need to do to, so I'm going I'm to drop our second route here, okay? So what, what's the strategy for, for doing this now? Let me get me started. Yeah. Yeah, so I've got two, you know, basically now I have three parameters that are coming in as part of my call. I have the operation, and then I have the two operands, okay? Um, so after I, and actually I can do it before, right? I can say uh, operation is equal to, what, so what type of data should this be? The first and second, I had this conversion to int. What, what kind of piece of data is this? Yeah. Well, it's eventually we're going to convert it to a function, right? I can't pass a function in a URL parameter. I wish I could. That would be actually really cool. Um, so what, what is this going to be? It's going to be a string, right? That's how it's coming in. So I don't have to do any conversion here. I'm just going to call call.parameters operation. And so if you look here, if you guys are following along, you'll, you'll notice what, what type has IntelliJ inferred for that? What type has Kotlin inferred for this? String. It's a nullable string. Why? You guys remember? Because Kotlin's not sure that the map has that key. Okay? It's possible that this map, call.parameters is a map. I'm using, it's sort of like Python, like a Python dictionary. I'm using these as keys. But it's not sure that it really has that. But I'm sure that it has it because I just wrote the route. And so what I'm going to do to get this to go away, again, this is not usually the right thing to do in Kotlin, is I'm going to throw in this 
double bang operator at the end. So now you'll see the inferred type has changed to string. Because what's going to happen is if my parameters map does not contain this key, this is going to throw a null pointer exception, and I'm going to end up down here, which is what I want, right? If, uh, if you didn't, you know, again, down here we're doing the two int, and that's also going to end up here. But right now, somehow you managed, we wouldn't get into this route if I didn't have an operation. So this is going to be okay. So now I've got my operation, and I've got my first and second. So now what do I do? Who can who can who can give me the like the Kotlin esque way of doing this? It's a very fun, intuitive Kotlin esque way of performing this. Essentially, I want to use this string to decide what type of operation to perform. Right? How do how do I do that? Let me let me show. Well, I mean, I can show you the non Kotlin esque way of doing it. Right? The you know I'm stuck with a language like Python way. Right? Add you know. First plus second, else if operation is equal to multiply, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, first times second, else if operation is equal to, will someone stop me, please? Like, what's the right way to do this? First minus second. I'll make, at least I'll make it slightly Kotlin S by using the re, uh, uh, my return expression, right? So now, okay, that's great. Else if operation is equal to divide, what? When! Somebody said when. Yeah, thank you. Saving me from this torture. Okay, when result. I'm still going to use the when statement as an assignment. So I'm going to say my result. Oh, this is going to be a val. When operation, and I'll say add first plus second. I'm going to get rid of all this shit because that's pretty terrible. <laughs> all right, now, here's a question. So this is angry with me right now, right? Because it's saying whenever I use when, it has to be exhaustive in the sense I have to enumerate all the possible cases. Now, the problem is that Operation is a string, and so there's no way you're going to enumerate all the possible cases. There are times where you, if I had like an enum or something where Kotlin knew how many values there were, those work really well in a win statement. But here I have a string. So what I need to do is I need to add an else statement. And what should my else statement do? So basically, eventually, I'm going to have an operation table that starts to look like this, right? Um, I need to be able to spell things. Subtract, multiply, first time, second, right? So eventually I'm going to enumerate all the possible operations I support, and if I fall through this table, what should happen? Like, let's say you put in foo. Yeah. Yeah, I want to end up bad down here, right? I'm going to tell you this is a bad request, like it's an invalid request. So the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to th throw an exception. So I'll say throw, and the syntax here is very similar to Java. And I'm going to, I'll print out something nice for you. Um, I'll say operation is not supported. So I have some idea of what happened. And I've got a typo down here. That's okay. All right, so this is nice, right? And I can see how to easily add new cases to this. Right, um, you know, it's just one line. If I want to add divide or, you know, log or whatever. Okay, so now I've done the w I've done the work. I have my result and results. You can see that Kotlin's inferred that to be an int. Right, and this is actually worth worth stopping and thinking about. Right, so the else statement here does not actually yield a value. It throws. Right, but Kotlin knows that if this throws, then I'm going to jump out of this block anyway. Right? So basically, Kotlin is smart enough to know now that result is an int. Right? Result is not going to be an exception. So I just want to make sure you understand. This else statement um, does not assign to result. It's going to cause me to jump down into my catch block, at which point result's out of scope anyway. Right? So it doesn't matter.
And this is common, like when, you know, if, if, if you're doing something like this and you're enumerating some possibilities and you get to the bottom and you're like, what should I do, right? Like, there, I don't need to set a default value here. I'll just throw and then I can handle, I can handle that down. All right, so now what about how to return the result? How should I do that? So I've got this add result class that doesn't seem appropriate to use anymore. How should I do it instead? Yeah. Yeah, so subtract result we already ditched. Now let's do this. I'm going to re just rename this to result. Now it's always useful whenever you're doing you're building a web API to try, try to return as much information to the client as possible. Then it makes the client side programming a lot easier. So, and I need to fix this, so I'm, res I'm returning my result. Okay, let's stop here for a minute and just make sure things are working. So I'm gonna restart my web server, go back to, go back here, and let's try subtract. That seems to work. Let's try add, oh, sorry. That also seems to work. Let's try multiply, that should work now. If I can spell it, that's not how to spell multiply. Yeah, okay, cool. Let's try something that doesn't exist. Log, bad result, error 400, so that's good. Contact the site owner, I love that. No, no thanks. No email address for the site owner <laughs> is going to be provided. Um, all right, but but what like what else could I return in my result, right? So right now when I return, I'm returning the first and the second argument and then the result. What piece of data is missing here that could potentially be useful to send back? I mean, the information you return to the client is not always things that the client didn't know. Sometimes it's just useful to send something back that res represents kind of a full expression of what happened. So what's missing here? Dave? Uh, yeah, what operation did I perform? Yeah, so let's just add that to our result class. Again, this is Kotlin, so the ceremony is limited. I just add this here as a string, and then all I need to do is go down here. Now it's angry with me because it knows I need to provide this, so I'm gonna provide the output. Great. Okay, let's restart this and make sure that things are still working. There you go. All right. So now let's say we want to add a new operation. What do we do? It's literally this easy. Restart it. Remember, this is going to be integer division. Um, so the results aren't necessarily. Let's try something like that. That looks like it worked. Okay. So this, you know, again, this doesn't have to be hard. And in fact, you know, one one of the things that's that that's really enjoyable, right? I found myself, you know, as I've been as I've been enjoying getting to know Kotlin, like, you know, I, I feel like I set out to do something and then I write a few lines of code and I feel like it's done. And then a lot of times it is done, right? But I'm like, wait, I should have like another 300 lines of code to write. But you don't. Just this is it. So now we have a little calculator. And again, if we wanted to extend this with different. Um, different operations, we're, ending, we're, we're basically just adding lines to this one expression. Questions about this before we go on? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, can we return a, can we return something down here? I think the answer is yes, let's try it. So I think there's a way to re respond with both, yeah, so see, one of the options for respond is to send a status code and then a message, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna send both the status code and then the error message. Let's see what happens if we just return the exception. I actually don't know how the browser is gonna handle this, but we'll see. All right, so that still works, and let's try something like foo. There we go. Yeah, that's kind of nice. 
What you don't see anymore is you don't see that browser air screen, but if you look, if you go here and we look at what actually happened and the thing and the status code that was returned, you can see the status code down here is still 400. So the browser still, like your client would still know this was an error. Like if you're using this API as part of your program and you made a mistake, you would still get an error code back along with the response. Does that make sense? Yeah, and if, and if like, we can make this a little cleaner. Right now we're sending back the whole exception. We could just send back the message. Um, oh, it's angry with me because not every, not everything has a message. Well, we'll just leave it as it is. Okay. All right, good. Other questions? Yeah, Marcus. Yeah. Oh, this part? Yeah. Wh what do you want to know about it? Oh, sorry. Okay. Where? Yeah. So the, the map is right here, right? I actually declared it inside the function. It's probably not the right place to do it, but it's okay. It worked. And then down here, so, so Marcus is asking about the counts uh, feature. So we can actually, uh, let's try that. I forgot that that was still here. By the way, like we're just messing around, but in general, like don't build a web API that both counts the number of times people do things and does math. Like both of those are kind of toy projects, but don't do them in the same thing. We're just doing it because it's because it's fun. You guys get to see a couple of different ways of doing this. All right. So this one, remember, is designed to count the number of times that you visited a particular URL. Um, somebody came up last time and showed me that Safari. This gets very weird. I think it's because Safari is actually doing loads behind the scenes. So your web browser does all sorts of optimizations to try to make your web browsing experience really fast, right? So don't assume that the only time the browser would load a page is directly when you go to it, right? It also happens at other times. Did you have a specific question about that, Marcus? Or just across it? Okay. David, do you have a question? Yeah, so the question is, can we convert this basically like a higher order function that accepts to, yeah, we probably could. I don't want to try to do it because I feel like I'll get bogged down and we won't get it done. But but if you like, if you want, like that's a, that would be a, a fun project to work on for next week, right? See if you can get that to work. So, so one of the things actually, it's worth pointing out, right? Let me try this. Let me see if this will work. I haven't tried this before, so bear with me. It's possible that this isn't gonna do anything useful. Yeah, that's the problem. Um, The, um, the, the, the trick is how to get at these as operators, right? Um, for those of you that have some experience with C++, one thing that Kotlin does add to the language that I feel like is debatable whether or not it's a useful feature is this idea of operator overloading. So I can actually, in Kotlin, I believe, I haven't done this because I think it's dumb, but you can overload these common operators with your own implementation, right? So you can basically decide I want plus on my classes to behave in a certain way, right? In Java, the only things I can add together are ints and doubles and strings. But in Kotlin, I'm pretty sure that you can implement plus for your class, and then you can have it do things. And I think that's terrifying. And so don't do it, right? It's sort of, s sort of stupid, right? But C++ has warped people's minds until now everyone thinks this is a good idea. Um, I don't know uh, other languages that do this, actually. Python does it, too. Like, Python, you can make things that act like lists and don't don't actually do any useful things at all, right? So it's kind of terrifying. I was going to add one thing. I think that one of the big reasons for the recent fix to do is that you're looking at all the elements of all the code and you can't do it in one place and that's really terrifying. Yeah, so, so the, the idea is that when I'm using Kotlin to build DSLs, which we're, we're sort of seeing here, right? Like we talked before about how some of this looks a little bit like a configuration language, right? This sort of thing. And this is really, just a, a nice combination of Kotlin's built-in features, right? Like higher order functions um, and the trailing lambda syntax, right? Um, 
We may talk about that later in this lesson because it's, it's kind of a neat feature. All right, so the next thing, let's, let's do, okay, so we're gonna do, do two more things today. The first one is that we're gonna go back to testing, okay? <laughs> so I got this to work. There was a, I'll show you what the problem was. Um, there, was a, there was a bug in my build.gradle. Uh, so make sure if you were following along that you have, I think I was missing a colon here, okay? Um, and so here is, and again, I wish I had like a deep um, sense of why this, you know, well, I, I know why it works, but like some deep secrets to share with you here, but I don't. This is just the pattern that you use for writing tests in Kator. Okay, so what's going on here? Let me lower this so I can, well, it's not gonna work, okay? So this is, I'm, I'm using um, Kotlin test or co-test to write my tests. I have a description of what the test should do and then I have uh, anonymous function or a lambda that runs. This function is provided, this higher order function is provided by Ktor for testing. So this essentially creates a test application context that allows me to pretend that I'm calling these methods on an instance of my application. So remember back here, I called, I added adder as an extension function onto the application class. And so I'm using that here to refer to my, my, uh, my configuration, basically, okay? Past that point, things might start to look a little bit more normal, all right? So handle request, this essentially says, uh, I'm, this is, describes the request I'm performing. I'm performing a get request for the root URL. And then this apply syntax is not something that we've talked about, but um, let me show you another way to do this, okay? So I could do, uh, right, hold on, that request is equal to handle request, and then down here, let's say request.response, and then request.response. Okay. So this is another valid way of doing this, right? This is a more traditional way of writing this code. Let me walk you through why you want, why you want to use some of these other syntaxes. So here what I'm doing is I'm creating a variable called request that's the result of making the request to that specific URL, and then I'm testing certain things about it, right? I'm testing the response to make sure that the status code is 200, that's HTTP status code okay. That means that it was an okay request. We'll see how to use other values in a minute. And then I'm testing that the content should be equal to hello world. Okay, so I can run this test. Let me shut down my web server. and it will pass. But you'll see something here, right? Which is that I've created a variable called request that exists entirely to do these two things, right? And so Kotlin actually has a family and it's some, like starting next week, we're gonna go back to doing some of the lessons where we'll talk about some, some language features, right? Kotlin has a family of functions that are designed to help make these types of use cases uh, more, more convenient, right? Like I really don't want to have a variable named request. I don't need that. What I need is to be able to get at its contents. And so in Kotlin, if I want to do that, here's what I can do. I can, I can take something that would normally return a variable and I can stick something called also after it. There's a family of these, also let apply, sorry, apply is what I wanted, not also. They're a little different in terms of their syntax. The idea is that now apply, you'll see on the right it says this test application call. So now I'm writing code that has access to request as if it's this. So now I could move this code inside my apply block. I could say, now there's no request variable anymore. It doesn't exist, so I could say this dot response, okay? But usually the reason I do this is I don't need to say this either. I just go like that, okay? So what apply does is it says take whatever object has been just created and then 
run the following code as if it's running in the context of that object, right? So now I can use that object's fields and methods as if I have a direct uh, handle to it. And in this case, you see this just makes the code cleaner, right? I don't have a temporary variable called request, and I don't have to reach into request to get at the response content I'm after. This does the same thing, it's a little more elegant. Okay, and you can see when we're working with web APIs, at least right now, these are the type of things that we want to be able to test. We want to be able to test to make sure that status codes returned by the various routes are correct. We want to make sure that the content returned by the route is correct. Now this is a route that just returns a, um, this is a route that just returns a string, right? So this one's e kind of easy to test, okay? Let's try something else. Let's test our count route, okay? So, oops, sorry, I'm gonna cut the one place where you can get away with cutting and pasting a lot is test cases. Should count routes properly. Okay, so now I'm testing a new, I need to write a different description for it. So I'm testing a new route. The route I want to test is count. Okay. So the first time that I request count, I should get back an okay status quo. And what should the value be that I return? So that should be one, right? Because I'm counting the number of times I've, I've asked this particular thing. I've asked for this route. Another nice feature of uh, Kotlin test is the ability to focus tests. So when you guys are, when you're running a test suite, a lot of times you don't want to run the whole suite, you just want to run one test. If you want to do that in Kotlin test, the way to do it is with this focus operator. So I say F colon on that test name. And now when I run this whole suite, you'll see it's only going to run one test. So if I open this up, I can see that should count routes have properly passed. Um, when I'm developing, a lot of times I like to I like to find negative controls, right? So make sure just because something passes. So when you write a test and it passes, there's two things that could be true, right? The first is your code's correct. That's good. The second thing is your test sucks and it's not doing anything useful, right? That's also that's not good, right? So a good way to make sure your tests are correct is to just give them failing cases and make sure that they can distinguish them, right? So now I expect this to be wrong, right? Because this should be one, right? Let's, let's write a little bit of a longer test for these routes. So now let's have it request a different route, make sure that's also one. And now let's request the first again and make sure this is two run this guy and see, yeah, there it goes. So it passed. So I can open that up and show you guys. Plug in at the screen. Good. So, so again, I mean, I can't stress this enough, and I don't think it's something that we emphasize with you guys enough as you're starting off into the world of software development. Like, this is the right way to interact with your application, is to write tests. You don't just write tests because you want uh, to test your application. You write tests because this is how you get things to happen. Particularly when you start working on things that don't aren't user facing. So yeah, we can sit there and you guys can type into your, you know, like every time you make a change, you could go route by route and type it into your address bar and be like, does it still work? And it's like, why, right? You guys have better things to do, just write tests. And now if we go back and fiddle with something, um, we'll know, right, that, that whether we've, we've maintained the set of functionality that we expect. So again, I mean, if I go back here and let's say right now it's, right now it's giving me, um, you know, right now it's the, the count is starting at, at one. If I change it so the count starts at zero, now I broke my test there, right? So this is super, super, super useful. Uh, when, when, when any, when any, whenever you're developing a large software project, right? Particularly when you don't understand the dependencies between things, which you frequently don't because you're working on one small part and other people are working on other things. Okay. So now I'm going to show you a place where we, where we really need to write tests. Okay. So let's, let's, let's go on with uh, the math, the calculator example that, uh, that David sort of suggested. Okay. So right now, what how we've implemented this is we have a 
we're using a get. So there are two real primary types of requests you can make to a website. One is a get request. A get request, you say, give me this document. What we're doing, and this is not uncommon, is that we're embedding the parameters to our function call into the get request. Okay, so we're saying the first part's the operation, then there's a slash, second part is the first parameter slash, so then there's the second part. That's, that's not uncommon. But there's another way to do this that uses something called post. So post, so get is retrieving information, right? It's what it sounds like. You ask the server for a document. Now again, most of the times when you ask the server for a document now, you don't get like a file that's sitting on disk, you get the result of some sort of computation. When you go to Amazon and you request the home page, what they're giving you is the result of all their algorithms running in that moment, given all the information they know about you, to try to figure out what you are going to buy next, okay? It's not like they have a special page for you sitting there on disk somewhere, right? It's the result, this is the output of a computation that produces, you know, the, the page as you see it. But when we do things like submit forms, what you're doing is something called a post. So a post sends data to the server and expects something to happen. When we build web APIs, posts are frequently used to describe the request that we're trying to make. And so this is, this is a little bit different. What you're going to see is with a post, the content of the request contains what you want to do. Right now, the URL needs to encode all of the information about the mathematical operation I want to perform. But normally, particularly if you start to think about if I want to make things more complicated, right? How, like someone was saying before, like how would I encode like a you know, more complex data inside the URL. I don't want to do that. Instead, what I want to do is allow the, the person using the API to provide content in the request. So let me show you how this looks. All right, so just like I have a way to create get routes, I also have a way to create post routes. Post routes, just like get routes, also take a path. I've got to import this. Okay, great, all right. So now what I'm doing is I'm configuring a route in my web API that's going to accept post requests. This is going to accept a request that's going to have content. Now you might wonder how am I going to perform the calculation because I don't know what operation to perform. What I'm going to do, I'll, and I'll go through this and then we'll go back and explain it, is I'm going to allow the person sending the request to specify exactly what they want to do. So now I need a way to describe the request. And to do that, I'm going to use another data class. So I'm going to create a, I'm going to use result for my, let's call this data class calculator request. And this is going to have an operation, which is a string, a first value, which is an int, and a second value, which is an int. This looks a lot, so again, let me get these both on the screen. So look down here, my get request, I had to embed these inside the URL. My post request, they're going to be in the body. Now when we configured JSON to help us work with JSON, one of the things it will do is it will also take the content of a request to this endpoint and deserialize it into an object that we can work with as long as it matches the shape of the object that I've declared. All right, so what does that mean? Well, let's, let's do it and we'll see, right? Okay, so I've got my calculator request class. I'm gonna say request is equal to call dot response. Um, and then I'm going to use, there we go, calculator request. Actually, I have to import this here. Response is what I'm sending back. Okay. This request. Call that request. And then. Mm. Bear with me. Let me put you in here. Hold on a sec. I'm going to cheat.
will admit that the syntax of Ktor is not always the easiest to remember. Ah, call dot receive. Okay, sorry. There we go. Call dot receive, and then I'm going to provide the type of object I'm expecting to receive. And this is actually an overload. Uh, I gotta get this out of the way. Okay. All right. Phew. Terrifying. Um, all right. So what is this doing? Okay. Let's walk through what's happening here. So this is a method that I'm calling on the contents of the call that I'm in the process of processing. What does this look like? Anybody remember Java? What's happening here? One of these triangle brackets. This is a generic method. Yeah, exactly. So what this is saying is, I'm expecting to receive an object that you should deserialize as a calculator request. Right? That's the one that I defined up here. That calculated request has an operation, a first and a second value. Okay. And so for now, let's just stop there, and we'll we'll respond with a nice status message, and we'll just leave it at that. Okay. Well, actually, you know what? Let's print it. Let's print the request so that we can see what's happening. All right. So again. This is another sort of ode to why you write tests. How am I going to test this? Anyone want to take a guess? What was I doing before? So before I was going over here and I was just like going to the URL and this isn't up right now, right? I can run this and it'll run. Oh, sorry. I'm running the tests again. So again, I, I can run this. What's going to happen if I do this? Is that what I called it? Yeah. Let's get 404, right? Why? I'm making a get request. And I've only told Ktor that I'm handling post requests. So how do I make a post request to this endpoint? You can do this thing. There, there, there are some tools out there for doing this if you really want to, right? But I would say don't, okay? Because you'll hate yourself using them, right? They're, they're actually pretty terrible. Um, curl is particularly terrible. Um, Postman is like just only kind of terrible. These are programs that you can use for making these kind of requests, but we're not going to do that. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use the fact that we can write tests. So let's go back to our test class and let's write a simple test okay now we're gonna say should accept so now I'm writing a request here and so now what I have to be able to do and I can do this is I need to be able to configure the request before it goes out so I've, I've changed things a little bit right so handle request is a higher order function. It tells the testing harness what request I want to perform. And I need to change this because I'm doing a post and I'm doing it to the calculate route. But before I send it, I need to do something here. I need to actually fill in a body. Because when you make a post request, you put data in the body of the request. That's what gets sent to the server. And what I'm going to put in here if I can actually remember how to do this. Yeah, there we go. What I'm going to put in here is actually uh, so now I can actually fill in the request. This is the exact body that's going to be received. So for fun, let's just try putting in something dumb. Okay? Whatever. With an exclamation point. because that matter, That's important. And now let's try to run this and see what happens. I'm going to shut down my server. We're going to run the test suite. Okay. So, so far, nothing seems to have gone wrong. But let's see here. Let's add 
our check to make sure that the result completed okay. So this should be, I'm sorry, apply, not also. Just so they know. Okay, let's try it again. All right, so now it says it failed because. Okay, it said unsupported media type. So this has to do, this is just a, a, a dumb detail that we're gonna fix. Um, it's not that dumb actually. Um, so we need to tell the server that it should expect to receive JSON. And so to do that, there's a little magic incantation that we have to put in here. That's this. We're going to grab that, put that over here. So now what's happening is I'm telling, in when I make the request, I'm telling the server, expect to receive something that is JSON. Let me see, I might need to import this too. Nope. All right, let's try it now. Okay, so now what error am I getting? I'm sorry, this is, go away, how do I get rid of you? Ah, it's over here. All right, so now if I go all the way up to this nasty error trace, I can see that I'm getting a, I can go up to this one too. What's happening? This is a JSON syntax exception. So what's going wrong here? Someone explain to me what, what my program is trying to do and what's happening. So, so far we've only talked about responding with JSON, right? That's how I send data back, structured data. But when I'm building a web API and I want to be able to accept post requests, frequently I also want to be able to allow somebody to send me essentially something that's an object. I want the caller to be able to send me something that I can convert into a calculator request. How do I do that? Any suggestions? How am I sending data back to the client? JSON? I can accept JSON. Right? JSON will do both. JSON will take the body. That's what I'm doing when I make this call right here. This is telling JSON, take the contents of this request and try to convert them into a calculated request. Right now, this is failing because what you sent me is foo. Okay. And JSON doesn't know how to convert foo into a calculated request object that has a field operation that's a string, a field first that's an int, and a field second that's an int. So let's give it something that it might actually be able to, to, to work with, okay? And I would normally tell you to never write JSON by hand, but we're going to do it right now. All right, so let's do operation add first for second five, all right? Um, in, in Kotlin, in case you haven't noticed this, I can triple quote strings if I want to have string quotes in them, which is really nice. Trim just removes all the white space from the front and the back, allows me to lay it out a little bit more nicely. Okay, oh wait, sorry. <laughs> I wasn't gonna weak either. Okay, so let's try our, let's try our call again. and see if we've been have, have been able to do this properly. Okay, there you go. And now let's look at what it printed, if I can find it. There it is, right here. So again, this is the magic of JSON. Or I should say it's the magic of JSON support in all these existing languages. I sent in a string. But what I have now in my code 
as long as you give me things properly formatted, you gave me a string and automatically, without having to do any work other than write this line of code and design the class, I now have a Kotlin object called request that has fields of the correct type that I can now work with. All right, so what do I want to do? Got this request object, what should I, how should I handle this? Got a good start down here. Happily, so for now, and again, I'm not saying this is the right thing to do, but let's grab this. This is really the only piece of code I'm gonna need to move up here. Because all this stuff, JSON already, JSON already did for me. So JSON already took the strings that you provided. JSON's just a string, but it deserialized it into an object, and I know that the types are correct. We'll see in a minute what happens when they're not, okay? So now I'm gonna say result, and now I need to operate on request.operation. And all of these I'm gonna have to change to refer to my request. Okay. I'm gonna resist the urge to use an apply method here. And instead we'll just do this. If you, um, string interpolation in Kotlin, if I want a field from an object, I can close it in Curly. All right, so now I'm uh, now I'm uh, I'm supporting add, and now I'm going to pass back my result. So this is request.operation, and we can make this much nicer, but for now we're just copying this and we're going to pass back the result. Okay. <coughs> so let's make sure our test case still passes. Um, I don't think it's going to because oh I used add. Okay, great. Okay, so that's still working. What do you think is going to happen if I try if, if something like if I do something like this? Any guesses? Let's see. I had the same problem I had before. I had this JSON syntax exception, right? But now it's more specific. It's saying that I told JSON to take this string and deserialize it into a class where first was an int, and it doesn't know how to convert two to an int, and I don't blame it. Okay? I don't know if I, I can actually, let's try this. I'm not sure if this is gonna work or not. If I give it a string, yeah, so now it works, right? If what's inside the quotes is an actual, something that you can convert to a number, then we're good. All right, so now let's see what's coming back here. And we're not gonna test this yet. We'll talk about how to do that later. Uh, but for now, what I want to do is just print it. I'm just going to print the content of the response. Okay, here it is. Right? Also, JSON identifies the operation, includes the parameters and the result. So after like two weeks of struggling, this is like, how things actually work, right? This is how actual web APIs work. They take JSON requests. I mean, same web, eh, not every web API. There's still people using XML and people doing all sorts of other dumb stuff, right? There are alternatives to JSON and stuff like that. But the point is that a, a web API, many of them work largely along this pattern. Many of them accept post requests because it allows them to take much more um, data that has a lot more structure. Um, do some work, send back a response in JSON. Can I, again, can I test this on my, you know, with, with the actual server? Yeah. You guys can start, if you guys want to start packing up, you can. I will show you how to do this using the less terrible version of this tool, which is called Postman. So what I need to do before I can do this is I need to start my server. Where'd it go? I'm gonna run it here. Oh, sorry, it's in hello main.kt. So that's fine. I'm gonna go over to Postman, and now I need to put in the path to my route. I'm doing a post, the body, 
is going to be operation add and let's see what happens uh, where's the oh it's too big oh wow oh my gosh come back four okay I accidentally need to restore Postman because I can't find it anymore So again, if you need to do like manual experimentation, this is the this is probably the best tool out there to use, right? Except where where did it go? I know, but why would you do that? Uh, uh, window to left screen. Okay, there we go. Okay. So again, let's hit send. And you'll see this is what we got back. Right, so Postman allows me to send a request and see what the result is, and this is what we expect. Right, have an add, parameters are there. Um, we can go back to this and sorry, this is the response. Where did my? If I use an unsupported operation, what's going to happen? Right. Now you'll see internal server error, right? Um, and that's because if we go back and look at our code, what happened is when we got here, we threw an exception. Down here, we had wrapped our, our whole route in, in logic in an exception handler that returned bad request. If an exception occurred here, we're not doing that, right? And if I throw it out of a route handler and it's not caught, I end up with with an error 500. The right thing to do here is to just wrap this in a try catch block for now. Catch the exception. And then I'll just borrow this code from down here. Respond, respond with a bad request. In this case, I'm not going to I'm not going to tell you why. I'll just let you figure it out. So again, just just to be crystal clear, I I've, I've been leading you guys here by increments but this code down here is not correct I'm going to just delete this this is not the right way to do this right. you also notice that this is this is a little bit smaller already right partly because the this call is actually doing a lot of work for us right it's, remember before we had to take those strings and convert them to ints and hope that it worked and stuff like that. Um, JSON is doing a lot of the work for us right there. Right? What we get back already has the proper types for everything. Right? Like first and second are the proper types, operations the proper type. Um, so I don't have to worry about those type conversions anymore. The, the JSON library is doing those for me. Right? And it's flexible enough to be able to handle some of the, the corner cases that we noticed in a minute. Right? So, so again, I mean, if you look at you know, how do a lot of web APIs work? I mean, it's essentially take a request. Um, I might actually break it into, let me just rewrite this slightly. We'll say response is equal to, um, and, then I and then I respond with that. So take some JSON in, do some work. Here's the processing that I'm doing. Prepare, you know, prepare a response. Send the response back to the client. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so the, oh, gr it's a great question. So the question is, how in my test suite, right? Let's go back up here. What I want to be able to test here is I want to be able to test that the that I don't want to look at it, right? This is not the right thing to do, right? I, I printed this off right now because I want you guys to see it and we're almost out of time and I don't actually have a chance to do the next thing here, right? So let's run the test suite again. I'll give you guys a chance to see what's coming out of this. So the question is if I actually want to check whether or not my math is correct, how would I do that? Anybody have any ideas? What am I getting back from my API? It's 
this string, right? This is what's printed. I'm sorry there's all this other crap here. I'll try to figure out how to get that to go away next time. I think I know. So this is what I got back. What can I do with this? What's that? Yeah, but how do I get the number of the result, right? I can, ser I can, I can deserialize this. This is a string, right? Remember, Kotlin G JSON already took an object for me and automatically generated this nice string. I can invert that process. So in my test suites, frequently what you'll do is you'll take this, you'll convert it back into an object, and then you test the object field. Right? Again, doing this requires adding another dependency and stuff like that. I don't, I don't want to do it right now. Right? But this is, and we'll, we'll do it next time we come back to this project. Right? We'll go back and we'll talk about how to take this and then convert it back into a Kotlin object so that I can actually do stuff, right? I can test the fields, I can make assertions about them. And stuff like that. But yeah, that's exactly what you do. Right? And you can do that. The other place you can do that, so what, what's sort of terrible about this test? You know? Like imagine I have a really complicated request that has a lot of structure to it, right? What's, what's the, what, what part of writing the test is really going to be really going to make you mad? Yeah, writing this JSON, right? Like, what if I just fat finger this, right? Um, you know, and now it's like, oops, you know, hell, yeah. Um, writing JSON is feels like hell. So um, I can also generate this JSON in the same way. I could create a calculator request object, initialize it in code, and then just convert it to a string to pass into the request. There are some downsides to doing this, but it's a lot more convenient than the other thing to keep in mind too is that the, um, you know, part of part of what we end up testing here is that um, JSON works properly, and I believe that JSON works properly, right? So, um, at the end of the, so if you look at, right, so again, let's go back and look at this pattern, and let's think about how to test this better. So my pattern is convert a string into a Kotlin object, a string of JSON, of J JSON into a Kotlin object. Do some work and then convert it back into a string, convert the response back into a string. So look, this JSON did for you. This JSON did for you, okay? There are highly paid experienced programmers maintaining that library. I do not think that they got this wrong. So I don't really need to test that part of it. So how should I really write my test cases here? What part should I be testing? So right now, part of what I'm testing is that JSON works. Every time I send in the request, I'm testing to make sure that JSON works properly. And I also have to write JSON. So what should I really do here if I want to make this more testable? How should I refactor this a little bit so that I can test it? Yeah. Well, uh, don't pass in a string, right? But I have to pass something. So if, if I'm using, if I'm testing using Ktor, I have to pass something. But the right thing to do is to essentially take this, this stuff, right? I don't know how to mark it, and convert this into its own function. So this is really a function that takes a result, that sorry, that takes a request object and returns a result object. So if I refactor that in its own function, I can test it independently of the route. So if you look at you know, some of the libraries that we maintain for 125, we have tests across the web API, but not very many, right? You know, I was just working on this project the other day. I think we have about 200 odd tests right now. I think about 10 of them are across the web API, just for sanity. The rest are just internal stuff that are testing to make sure things work, right? Because again, I don't doubt this works and the first thing works, right? Those work fine, you know. It's the stuff in here that I wrote, and that's the stuff I worry about, right? Not about, about the library that's probably being used by hundreds of thousands of projects. That I'm pretty confident. Questions, comments on this? David. Oh no, that that's fine. No, that's 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 okay. What was incorrect was using the get request, right? 
Maybe that's what you were thinking. Yeah, so stuff like this is almost always done via post. Okay. It's very rarely done via join. Um, other questions? All right, so Friday I'm out, so we won't meet. Next Wednesday, we will go back and do a few more lessons on sort of Kotlin basics. So we'll look at nullability and working with nulls, since that's been sort of creeping into some of our conversations. We'll go over some of those clever helper functions that we were looking at, like apply and also, and we'll also talk about basic sort of object-oriented programming in Kotlin. So I will see you guys next Wednesday.